Hey. Let me just bring the worship team back up, call it a day. No? No, no, no. It's good. But uh, we're really thankful to have all of you here. Uh, we're excited to be able to come and fellowship every weekend. And we couldn't do it without you. There wouldn't be fellowship, right? We'd be here alone. We're thankful for you being here. If you're a first-time guest with us, we want to extend you a special welcome. We love when new folks come and visit. And we have a little saying around here, the first time you come, you're a visitor. Second time you come, you're family. We mean that. And we're glad uh, that you're here. If you're looking for a church home, uh, we'd love to help you uh, get acclimated here at Christ Community Church, uh, as Bree shared earlier. Today we're in our second week of our filled series, and the message today is entitled, uh, The Gift. In 1964, a man who was an antique collector in Scotland, he went and he purchased a little figurine. He didn't think much of it, but he thought it looked kind of interesting, so he purchased this little figurine, about the same size as this, about three and a half inches tall. He paid the equivalent of six dollars for this back in 1964, this little figurine. And for three decades, that figurine was the inheritance of his, of his daughter and then his grandkids. And this little figurine, it was at some point, it was on a shelf. And then as the story goes, they, they then ended up just kind of throwing it in a drawer, like anything else that had some sentimental value, uh, but we didn't really know what to do with it. And many of you have things around your home like that as well. So the family, 55 years later, this family had had this little figurine. And this is a picture of the actual figurine. Uh, they had this little statue, three and a half inches tall. They thought, you know what? I'd love to know what this thing is. Let's figure out uh, what this little three and a half inch thing is. We've been kind of lugging it around and passing it around. We inherited it. What is it actually? So they bring it to Sotheby's auction house and they have someone look at it and they bring it to the counter. And the first person looks at it and they spend a lot of time looking over it. They get on the phone and they call someone else in and they begin to look at it. And now there's like some activity going on. They're wondering what it is. So they say, hey, you might have something here. Can we keep it to investigate it in, in a little bit more? So they keep it a little bit longer, and then they invite them back in. And after they've done all their research, they say, hey, uh, we've, we've figured out what this is. This is one of five missing Lewis Chessmen uh, that has great significance to the history of Scotland, and it's really valuable. And they couldn't believe that they had been throwing this gift that they had gotten from their grandfather in a drawer for 55 years, and it had such a high significance. But like the rest of us, they asked the next question, how, what, what do you think that next question was? How much is it worth, right? All right, you guys are all tracking with me. So they asked the question, how much it's worth? Well, remember, their grandfather paid $6 for it in 1964, which even back then wasn't a whole lot of money. They told him the number. And it wasn't $600, it wasn't $6,000, it wasn't $60,000. This one of five Lewis Chessman pieces that was missing was worth $1 million. $1 million. Yet, it had just been wrapped up and thrown in a drawer for 55 years and carried around, didn't even know what they had. This gift, this inheritance was just thrown and discarded, and, and its value, the treasure of what it was, uh, wasn't really realized until 55 years later. A lifetime, actually, for this person's mother, she had had it and didn't know uh, what it was worth. There's a reason why I tell you that story. It's not so you can go home and search through all your junk drawers and see if you have something worth a million bucks. <laughs> you can try that. The truth is, is that when we accept Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we come into an inheritance, is what Scripture tells us. But I believe a lot of us just kind of wrap up that inheritance for one reason or another and throw it in a drawer and actually don't experience the full treasure of the gift of the Holy Spirit that we have in our life. I believe it to be true. And we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're going to talk about how, how we receive the Holy Spirit and, and, then, and then talk about some aspects of, of what that looks like in our life, some of the proofs to know that we have the Holy Spirit and what the impact of that is in our life and in our world. So let's jump right in. I want us to stand. We're going to uh, read Scripture here uh, aloud today. If you're new with us and you don't have a Bible, uh, the Bible is the living Word of God. It'll change your life if you read it each and every day. There should be a Bible under the seat in front of you. If you don't own one, take that home with you. Uh, go to the table of contents, look for the book of John, read a little bit every day, and ask God to speak to you, and it'll change your life. So we want you to have that uh, as your gift today. We're in the book of Acts. 
Uh, the book of Acts uh, starts uh, with, with Jesus' ascension into heaven, and he lets them know that the Holy Spirit is coming. We're in the second chapter, and earlier in the chapter where we are, the Holy Spirit comes at what we call Pentecost and descends upon uh, the, the believers in the upper room at that time. So as we, as we jump in here, we're looking at another moment where Peter uh, begins to preach to those who are in the area as well. So we're going to read verse 36 to 41 here together. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, and all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this time to read your word. We thank you, God, that we get to gather here as your body, God, filled with the Holy Spirit and focused on your word. We pray now, God, that you would speak to us through your word, God. God, we uh, do believe that your word is fully inspired by you, that it's without error, and we hold it as the authority in our life. And now, God, we give it free reign in our life as we study it. God, I pray these words would not be my words, but your words, God. Change our hearts right here as we study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. So I'm going to kind of take us through a little bit here, verse by verse. And the first verse I want to look at, of course, is verse 36. And uh, there's some important things that I want to point out here. The first part is, is that after Peter was done, he was talking about all the things the Lord had done. He had talked about all the things about Jesus. And he comes to them, and uh, this, this audience is important that we understand who he's talking to. He's talking to Israelites. He's talking uh, to the Jewish population. And it says that God has made this Jesus, you know, the Jesus who they mocked, the Jesus who they denied, the Jesus uh, who they saw go to the cross and who was buried for three days, the Jesus who raised from the dead, that guy uh, that they were following around and, and maybe some of them were not believing in. Uh, it says that God made this Jesus, the one that he's talking about, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Now that whom you crucified is important because it's highly likely that some of the Israelites, some of the Jewish people that were there in Jerusalem would have also been those that were following Jesus at his crucifixion yelling crucify him, would have been at his trial yelling crucify him. Some of the people that were there were those people that were denying him and who he was were actually not only that, but they were acting as, as enemies towards Christ Jesus. And now they were here they had seen Jesus be raised from the dead. They had, they had heard about his ascension to heaven, if not had witnessed it. And now Peter is here preaching to them to say, yeah, you know what? All those years of your life, you've been hearing the prophets in the Old Testament, uh, all those traditions, you've been hearing the prophecies about this Lord and Messiah that's going to come. And guess what? You missed it. It was him. You denied him the whole time. And also you crucified him. And the thing we need to know, too, is, is that this audience, they would, have known, they would have known about all these things because uh, they would have been a devout people. They were there in, the, in Jerusalem at that time to uh, observe Passover. And back then, uh, a lot of folks and regular people wouldn't be able to read or write. So it was an oral tradition. So they literally would memorize the scriptures. So they didn't have to get their Bibles out. They didn't have Bibles. Uh, they would have known those stories. They would have known what the prophecies were. And here it was all coming to fruition. They had denied that Jesus was who he was, and they were finally realizing that's who he was. When we think about this, some of the people in that room, some of the people that were there being preached to, were the very same people that, that had crucified Jesus. Now you might think, all right, well, I wasn't around when Jesus was crucified, so I'm not, I'm not responsible for that crucifixion. I, I didn't crucify Jesus thing we need to understand, though, is, is that Jesus came not just to die for the sins of the people that lived then. He came to die for the sins of every person that's born, 
uh, from then until he returns and creates a new heaven and new earth. That, that the sins that hung him on the cross uh, of those people are the same sins that hung him on the cross of us. So uh, by, uh, by default, our sins did hang Jesus on the cross. Now, you might say, I love Jesus. I, I've never screamed crucify him. I've never denied him. I've never done any of those things. But what we need to understand is, is that our sins is the reason why he was crucified. So in turn, we ourselves are also guilty of crucifying Jesus. But he did it for the reason of love. He did it for the reason to be our Lord and our Savior, our Messiah, and that's what Peter was preaching. He wasn't saying, look out for that uh, because you crucified Jesus. He said, hey, there's, there's more to this. So we'd keep going here to verse 37. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. I love this one word in here, uh, this one sentence in here that they were cut to the heart. You know, we can learn a lot about Jesus. We can learn a lot about the Bible. We can learn all these rules to follow. But you know what, what Jesus really wants to do? He wants to cut us to the heart. He wants us to show, show us his truth and his love. And he wants our heart to be affected and changed by it. What was going on was is that they had known all these things. They had denied that they were true. Uh, they, they were there, some of them, at the crucifixion. And now Peter was preaching to them the truth of the Word of God, and that truth of the Word of God was cutting them to the heart, and they were convicted in that moment. And you see, that's what God is trying to do in our life is, is he wants us to yield to him, to listen to his word, to humble ourselves. He's, he wants to cut us to the heart. And not in a bad way, but sometimes being cut in the heart hurts a little bit. Anybody in the room, uh, maybe you don't want to raise your hand, have, have you had a, a heart bypass surgery where they had to open you up? Anybody in the room? Last night we had a few. All right, thank you for standing out there. Now, I hope I never have to have that, but I've, I've heard uh, that there's a lot of pain involved because they have to break bone. They have to cut through all those layers of muscle, and then they're, they're literally cutting your heart to do that work. Am I accurate in saying that? And then, there's a, and then there is that healing recovery time where all that bone has to heal. There's a process there. But in the long run, you have a stronger heart and better health and a new lease on life, if you will, when we talk in human terms. But Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, He wants to cut us to the heart. And we need to come and be receptive to that and, and respond to that. So here they are. They're convicted of what Peter is saying. And it says that they're cut to the heart. And then they look at Peter and the other apostles and they say, brothers, what shall we do? You see, we're convicted. It leads us to a place where we have to respond. We can either deny the conviction, we can try and uh, slough it off and run the other way, or we can press into that conviction and, and find out what is it that I need to do in order to change the way that it's been uh, shown to me in my life, in order to get my life right with God, uh, what is it that I need to do? And you see, this is an important part about that heart change because Jesus came and made religion. He took religion from being this kind of external thing, uh, from being kind of an external religion. He changed it into being an internal faith, uh, that he's changing our hearts. In fact, in the Old Testament, in several places, it says that he's going to take our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. That's what God's plan is, is to change our heart. And all those things afterwards, all the things that we usually focus on, like good works and good behaviors and all of those type of things, they follow a changed heart, and that's what God's after. So they say, what must we do? Say that with me here for a minute. What must we do? I'm glad you asked that question. Well, here we go. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise that is for you and your children and for all who are far off and for all whom the Lord will call. You see, when God calls you to him, and God's calling you to him today here in this place, when we respond to that call, when we respond to that call, this word all, it, it means all. It means everyone. It means, it lo if you read in the chapter then, it, for them it meant those who were from a different uh, type of uh, nationality because uh, Jewish folks didn't believe that anyone else were chosen people. So it meant those who were far off, uh, both spiritually and geographically. It means a very similar thing here today, that the, the gospel, that the good news of Christ Jesus is for those who are far off. They're far off geographically, but they're also far off spiritually. You might have walked in here today far off from God. You might be far off. You might be running the 
total opposite direction of God and you're just hoping to get your life back together. And I hope that you can do that work with God here today. But regardless of where we are, uh, this promise of the Holy Spirit is for all who do what? Who repent. And as we think about repentance, we need to understand some things. The thing about repentance is, first time, repentance takes humility. If we're going to repent, it means that we've got to take some ownership of some things. Let's speak in human terms for a moment, okay? Uh, Mary, let's say that I've offended you for a minute. Uh, Mary's our bookkeeper for our church here, by the way. Love you, Mary. Appreciate all your service. But let's just say I've offended you for a moment. The first thing I have to do when it's been brought to my attention that I've offended someone is what? I have to humble myself and actually take ownership of that. I can't blame it on other people. I have to take ownership for what I've done. The next part of repentance is, is it's including in confession. Now I have to agree that, I, that what was brought to my attention is wrong. And when we talk about confession and confession before God, what that means is we're agreeing with God that yes, the direction of my life, the thought pattern, my beliefs, my behavior, whatever the case may be, that it's not of God, we have to confess and agree that it's wrong. That's a confession. We're not quite all the way there yet, though. The, uh, once we've gotten to that place of humility, taking ownership and, and confessing, we then need to ask for something. What would, you, what would I ask for after I've confessed to you, Mary? What would I be asking for? Everyone say it out loud. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. So we have to have humility, and then we have to admit and confess, agree that where we're at is not where we should be, or what we did was not what we should have done. And then the next part is we have to ask for forgiveness, and we need to know that Jesus, when we do that, gives us forgiveness freely and wholly, and once and for all, it's gone forever. But what happens if I leave it there? If I walk away the next day and I do the very same exact thing to Mary that I did the day before and offended her, we're good though, right? This is just a little hypothetical. All right, get my own, you know, I have post-social anxiety. Anyways, but the next day, if I just repeat the offense, guess what I didn't do? I might have confessed and I might have asked for forgiveness, but you know what I didn't do? I didn't repent. The Amplified Bible says it this way, it says that Peter said to them, repent, change your old way of thinking, turn from your sinful ways, accept and follow Jesus as the Messiah. You see, repentance means that we've had a change of mind, a change of heart. We've, we've, we've had some heart surgery, if you will. Uh, we've been shown the error of our ways. We've been shown the right way. We've been given the grace and love of Christ Jesus. And now we're going to turn and follow his way to the best of our ability through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what repentance is. And what's the promise with that? It says we have to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And we need to know that baptism, uh, I think there's a baptism class today at 1015, if I'm correct, uh, upstairs if you haven't been baptized yet. Baptism uh, doesn't save us. Uh, baptism is the declaration to the public that says, hey, I have decided to follow Jesus. It says that I've realized what I need. I need to repent and follow him, and I'm doing that, and we're going to let the world know uh, that I am going this way, uh, that I have decided to follow Jesus, and that there's no turning back. I know you guys want me to sing the song that know that hymn I'm not going to. I have decided. No, sorry. But that's what repentance is. But we need to talk about a couple other things before uh, we move on. Uh, the first one is, is that we need to realize that this is a gift. Some of us uh, have, have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. We've been given certain spiritual gifts, but unfortunately, instead of them leading us more towards God and, and building up the body, they've led us to a place of spiritual pride. We hold ourselves in higher regard than we should because we begin to take credit for a gift. You can't take credit for a gift. A gift in its essence is something that we were given that we didn't pay for, that we didn't earn, that we don't deserve. That's a gift. It's the same gift in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It says, for by grace you have been saved, not by work so that no one can boast, but it's a gift of God. <laughs> that the fact that Jesus came and died on the cross for us, that's a gift in the same way we can't take credit or try and earn a gift of the Holy Spirit. And there's some different churches out here that have different views about when the Holy Spirit comes into our life. And I want to unpack that for us a little bit here today. It's really important for us to understand when and how the Holy Spirit comes into our life. So th there's some different beliefs out there. Now, uh, some of the traditions that we're from here in this room uh, would have been that we go to a X amount of classes and we do X amount of things 
uh, with the church, and then finally a church official. When we get to a, a certain age, we would, we would have this time where, the, uh, where that person, a church official, a pastor, or, or whatnot, uh, would, 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 would verify uh, that we've done all of these things and we've received the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, I stay away from saying the names of churches, so you figure that out if you can identify with that statement, okay? Uh, but that's not what the Word of God says on, on how we receive the Holy Spirit, because I just read a verse that said when we do what? When we repent, just so you're tracking with me. When we repent is when we receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's another uh, a Christian tradition uh, that would say that we need kind of a second blessing, and some of you might be from a background. Maybe you're watching on TV, or you're going to listen to this on a podcast, uh, maybe you believe that, that we need a second blessing. Some churches believe that we get the first blessing at salvation, and then we get a second blessing later on with a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, again, that's not what we find in Scripture, and I'll show you where they find that here in a minute. Uh, what we believe here is from Scripture is, is that as soon as uh, a sinner turns from their way, as soon as we repent and give our life to Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit then enters into our life. Jesus says he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. There's no qualifier on that. That is just a promise. He doesn't say, if you do this, I'll do that. He just says, hey, when you repent, I'm going to be with you forever. You're mine, and I'm yours, and there's no changing that. No takey-backies. That's how that works. But some people believe that we need a second baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you where they get that from, and that if you go ahead, and I just want you to go read this on your own, but I'm going to give you the reference. If you jump ahead to Acts 8, uh, we see that the church was scattered uh, to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Philip, uh, one of the disciples, is in Samaria, and he's preaching to the Samaritans. Now, Jewish people at the time believed that the Samaritans were unclean because they weren't fully Jewish. They were half Jewish, and they didn't follow the law the way they did, so they considered them unclean. They didn't go to Samaria, okay? That was like the wrong part of town. They just would not go there. But Philip goes because the Holy Spirit led him there, and he begins to preach the gospel. And it says in Acts 8 that the people listened and that they, that they believed and that they were baptized. It says that in just very similar pattern to around here. Um, but they believed and they were baptized. But then it says that he, let, he sent word to John and Peter back in Jerusalem, and they came out to see what was going on in Samaria. When John and, Peter, John and Peter got there, they saw that the people had not received the Holy Spirit yet. So then they laid hands upon them and prayed over them that they would receive the Holy Spirit, and they did. Now, if you take just that one chapter of Scripture all by itself and read it not in context of the whole Word of God, it would be easy to run off with the fact that everyone needs to come rushing forward to the altar, and I need to lay hands on you so you can have the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, I believe that we can receive another filling of the Holy Spirit, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, but there's not this uh, two-stage process to receiving the Holy Spirit, and I'll show you why, uh, because if uh, let me stop there for a second. This is why it's important that we read the whole book of Scripture, not just isolated passages. When we just pop a verse out here, read it out of context, don't do any work, we, we miss the point quite often and we misinterpret Scripture. And that's why I always encourage you to go and read it for yourselves. Uh, find out for yourselves and read it in context. Let's jump ahead. Acts chapter 10. Here we are now with Peter, who has a dream, a dream that this sheet is being unfolded from heaven, and it's got all kinds of animals, every animal on the earth, and he's seeing this dream, and it's telling him in the dream uh, that God is saying that all things are made clean under Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying. All people, all things are, are, are being made clean under Christ Jesus. And then he tells him that someone's going to come and ask for him, this man named Cornelius. At the same time, Cornelius, who's a commander in the Roman Guard, he's a nice Italian guy, okay? He's got about 600 uh, men underneath him. But guess what? He's not Jewish. He's a Gentile. Now, if you're not Jewish and you're here, you're not, you're, you're, you are a Gentile. That's what Scripture would call you, anyone who's not Jewish. Originally, though, the Jewish people believed that God was only for them. But there's some reasons why it goes the way it did. So then when the Gentiles, uh, when Peter goes, he preaches to the Gentiles. And while he's preaching, it says in the Scripture, Acts 10, go and look it up, that the Holy Spirit descended upon them while he was preaching that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, that their, their belief, they responded right in the middle of the message, and they received the Holy Spirit. And then he says this. He says, 
These people have the Holy Spirit. I see no reason why they shouldn't be water baptized. You see, the baptism through water is just a a symbol of God's presence. It doesn't bring God's presence. It's a symbol of that. Now, back in Samaria, when we think about those Samaritans and why it happened after, the reason why most theologians would agree is that God was showing the Jewish people that the same pouring out of the Holy Spirit that was there for them at Pentecost is also there for the Samaritans. So they, he, was, he delayed it for his own purposes. But that's not the pattern that we see. It's not the Word of God that we read when we read the entirety of Scripture. So when you ask Jesus Christ into your life sincerely and wholeheartedly, you receive the Holy Spirit. That's what Scripture says. When we repent, we receive the Holy Spirit. And I outlined what what, what that means. So why do we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit if we already have Him? If you go back to last week, we talked about the Holy Spirit and who He is. He's a person. And if you're in a relationship with a person... How do you grow in that relationship? You invite them to spend time with you. You begin to talk with them more often. You invite them over to your home. You invite them into your life. When you think about your closest friends in life, uh, there's this intimacy, this growing in fellowship and friendship, and that's what we're talking about, about being filled with the Holy Spirit, that we need to continually invite and ask the Holy Spirit to come and to fill us with His presence. And when we have His presence, we have all the things that the video talked about, His, his power and His protection and His guidance and His wisdom. All those things come with a friendship, just like a good friend in your life would come in and do those things. Just like your friends rub off on you, now in human relationships, friends rub off on us, good or bad, right? They, they rub off on us either way, good or bad. But the Holy Spirit, thankfully, He's all good, right? Everyone say, all good with me. He's all good. So when we're in that relationship, the more we're in that relationship with the Holy Spirit, the more we're seeking Him and pursuing Him. This is what we're talking about, about being filled with the Holy Spirit. That we are looking to be filled with His presence over and over and over again. Uh, Now, if we go on in this and we see the fruit of of what happened in this moment, of them having the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is present, amazing things happen. It says that Peter, with many other words, he he, uh, warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves uh, from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. I believe our God can still work in that way. Do you? Now, maybe not 3,000 in a day. And, and listen, we're not talking about just adding 3,000 to, to this church membership. We're talking about adding 3,000 to the kingdom membership, okay? Whether it's this church or another church, uh, we'd love to add some folks. Uh, but we know that there's other churches around that we're part of, that, that, that the kingdom is there. We want to add people to kingdom membership. But I believe that God can add 3,000. Now, maybe he doesn't do it in one day, but, but can I get someone to buy into maybe one week? Josh, do I hear one week over there? Uh, Tommy, I got a one month over there, sold over there, a month maybe? How about six months? Anyone want to be a highest bidder on six months? Maybe God could have 3,000 people, all right? We're having a little auction here. Uh, but the truth is, is that we need to believe these things. We need to hold on to them. God is working through us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we continually invite him in in our relationship, all the goodness of God, all the treasures of who he is, they pour into our lives the same way a good friend uh, would, would be there with us. So as we move on in the message, there's a big question here. How do we know we have the Holy Spirit? How do we know? Some traditions would say that you have to speak in tongues. And then if you don't speak in tongues, then they begin to doubt actually your salvation. But that's not the truth of the Word of God. Write this reference down. 1 Corinthians 12, 30 says, not all speak in tongues. There's people here in this room that have the spiritual gift of speaking a spiritual heavenly language of tongues. I wholeheartedly believe that. But there's many uh, true believers right here in this room that don't speak in tongues, myself being one of them, uh, that, that love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, but I don't speak in tongues. And Scripture verifies that. So how do we know? I'll give you a few ways. Uh, Romans chapter 8, if you want to write this reference down. Romans chapter 8, 13 and 14, it says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, and you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. It's a pretty simple question. Are you being led in your life by the Spirit of God? 
Or are you still being led by the Spirit of yourself? If the Holy Spirit is your best friend, is he with you everywhere you go? Are you counseling with him about all things? Think about a good friend or a spouse in your life. You talk about everything, from the big stuff to the little stuff. Uh, hopefully you're praying together and, and, and talking about God's word together. Uh, but we, we spend and share all of these moments in life together uh, with our friends or with our, our, our spouses, whatever the case may be, those close relationships in our life. The Holy Spirit's a person. It's the same. He wants to lead us and direct us and guide us. And he's not just some external friend. He's internal. He knows our very thoughts. He knows our heart. So my question is, is is he leading your life? Now, he might be leading you and you keep ignoring him. He he may be keeping telling you to go left and you keep going right and you're wondering why life is so conflicted. It's because you haven't yielded to the leading of the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't mean he's not there. You just keep ignoring him. That's one way we know is we have that sense there. Here's another way. The Holy Spirit brings his fruit to our life. Not our fruit. Uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of Matt or the fruit of anyone else in the room, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and the one I need the most of, especially around sweets, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Is there evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life of those fruits beginning to well up, even beyond your own understanding that, that as you yield and pursue the Holy Spirit, do you begin to see this peace and joy and love and patience and forbearance and self-control in your life like you haven't had before? That's proof that the Holy Spirit is there. Now, I get that we often fight against some of those things because we go on and we try and then still have all these uh, kind of passions in our life. It says that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, uh, have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, or envying one another. You see, we still have a a tendency towards that because our old sinful nature is fading away. But are we pursuing, are we asking for the fruit of the Holy Spirit to be in our life? Another way to tell whether or not the fruit of the Spirit is in your life, look at those who are closest to you. Do you see the fruit of the Holy Spirit beginning to grow in their life? You see, we all have influence in our lives. You may not think you're a leader, but uh, I call leadership influence, and and every one of us in this room has people that we influence in our life, and that fruit that's grown in our life begins to grow on other people's trees, as Dave Ferguson would say, that that fruit begins to grow there. Look at those lives around you. How are you influencing other people in your life? A lot of it is, is just through that normal osmosis and the mirroring of your life, but those are ways that we know we have the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, but that only which is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. You see, as we have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life, he leads us in that place. He begins to change our heart. He cuts us to the heart in those areas, and all of those things go away. The, the, yes, they, they may still pop up sometimes, uh, but, but our, we are, we're really growing in those areas. So when you think about those who you influence in your life, which way are you influencing them? Do you see all of that with them? You see the Holy Spirit, that gift, it is first for us, but most importantly, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit for the other people in our life. So as we think about those proofs of the Holy Spirit, we we look for that leading, we look for that fruit, we look for that change of heart, but we need to know that if we keep resisting the Holy Spirit's leading, if we continue to to just ignore the Holy Spirit's uh, prompting in our life, what we do is we grieve the Holy Spirit. He's a person. He he has feelings just like we do. And when we feel that sense of conviction in our life, some of us might even say, gosh, I can't believe I just did that, said that, act like that. I don't even know if I'm really a Christian. That might be what you're saying to yourself. You might have said on the ride here today because you cut some guy off, gave him the finger. I don't know. Hey, we're in New England, man. Anything can happen, all right? Just put it out there. If that was you, I didn't, I was not the guy that you cut off. Sorry. (laughs) see the left blinker go on. Anyways, but the truth is these things grieve the Holy Spirit and that grieving inside of us that we feel, guess what? It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It means you have the Holy Spirit because if you didn't, you wouldn't be feeling the grieving of the Holy Spirit. You with me? That's what it's talking about. 
But here is the definition I want to give with you, and then I want to, add, I want to share some application with you. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is this. It's to be energized and controlled by the third person of the Godhead in such a way that under the acknowledged lordship, when we've made him Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the full presence and power are experienced. Spirit filling leads to renewal, that's evidence, obedience, boldness and testimony, and an arresting quality in a believer's life that he has us and we know he's just not letting us go. I want to close you with this question today. Do you really want to be filled by the Holy Spirit? Yes. No, I mean really. Yes. Thank you, Carol. Well, I got one. But do you actually want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You know what? Because sometimes in my life I act like I don't want to be. Sometimes I'm just too comfortable. Sometimes in my life it's like I pulled out the cell phone and I hit that do not disturb button and then I got to decide what will interrupt me and what won't. We live our life that way. We got our life kind of set up in this place of comfort. We're, we're afraid that the Holy Spirit, if we allow him in so much, if we do all these things, that there's some areas of our life he's going to challenge us in. He might ask us to say something, go somewhere, do something, give something that maybe we didn't really want to let go of just yet. Well, we got this do not disturb or don't interrupt me kind of mindset in life, and sometimes I fall into that comfort place, and, and I'm guessing that you could relate with that sometimes, that we kind of fall into this pace of life, and, and we say we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but we kind of want it on our own terms. That's not how the Spirit of God works. He wants to come into your life and overflow you and transform you. Here's another thing I think that I'm guilty of, and maybe you can relate. I think sometimes I'm a bad friend. You know what a bad friend is? It's someone who only calls when they need something. I believe that when it comes to my friendship with God and the Holy Spirit, that there's sometimes, and maybe you can relate, that I'm only calling on him when I need something, uh, but then, you know, it's on a, a call as needed kind of basis in my relationship with the Holy Spirit. Well, you know what that means? That in that moment, I, I've kind of not really wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I haven't wanted to grow in my fellowship with the Holy Spirit. I just want to talk get the results. I don't really care about listening or spending time. I'm just a bad friend. Maybe you can relate. Uh, some of us in the room, uh, we've been filling ourselves with everything but the Holy Spirit. We've just been filling ourselves up. Life is kind of off the rails. It's going the wrong direction. We're far off from God. We, uh, some of us right here today, that, that, that we have been filling our life with everything but the Holy Spirit. We have a God need in our life but we're trying to fill it with the worldly things, and it's just leaving us more and more empty and more broken, and we feel further and further away from God. I've been there, and I know many of us in the room feel that way, even today. Yet some are here today that have yet to actually profess to repent fully and say, God, I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. You haven't done that. I pray that today you'd be cut to the heart by the words of God and by the Holy Spirit and say, I'm going to give my life to you. And like I like to ask, what are you waiting for? Uh, you've heard the truth. You've seen the, the evidence of the Holy Spirit and the work of other people's lives. And here at church, what are you waiting for? Are you scared? Is it pride? Are you nervous that maybe it's going to interrupt your life? Well, you know what? I want to pray every day, God, interrupt my life. Disturb me. There's nothing that I have going on in my life uh, that's more important than what you're going to interrupt me with, okay? Those interruptions far surpass anything I have going on in my life because your plan is good, pleasing, and perfect. And, and church, that's what we need to focus on in our life. But guess what? Whatever your category is, whatever you feel like is getting in the way of you being filled with the Holy Spirit, the pathway is the same for every single person in this room. You know what it is? Anybody guess it? It's repentance. And hey, I think a lot of times we think about repentance as some down and dreary kind of thing where we have to be all humdrum and feel terrible about it and kind of whipping ourselves and walk around like we're worthless. That's the mindset many of us have in our life. But listen, yes, repentance initially cuts us to the heart. It makes us feel bad about ourselves, but it's because God wants to convict us of our, of our sins and our ways because he loves us. He's not condemning us. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross, but there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And when we repent, we should then rejoice because it says in Scripture that when a sinner is turned from their way, that there's a celebration in heaven. It doesn't have to be down and dreary. It doesn't have to be abysmal and sad. Repentance actually brings us to a place of life 
and a filling of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to invite you today, and if you're new, I don't normally do this, but I want to invite you as, as I pray. I'm going to pray here in a minute. If you're like, you know what? I've made it something. It's not. Uh, it may be a different category, but I want you to uh, stand as I pray as a, as a sign that, you know what? I'm repenting. I'm going to turn to God. I'm going to stop making it what it shouldn't have been. I'm either giving my life to God for the first time, or I'm recommitting to say, God, fill me in this area. Forgive me of what I've made it, and I'm not just going to give lip service. I'm going to repent and turn and follow a new way. Here's what repentance needs, though. It needs action. See, many of us just want to offload some guilt to confess what we feel bad about what we've done, only to go out and do it the next day. But you know what repentance needs? It needs action. Repentance without action is just lip service to God. That's not what what the Word of God is saying to us. It's calling us to a place of action. I'm going to pray, and I want us to consider where we're at. If there's things you need to repent in life and, and get back on track with God, uh, just stand as I'm, I'm praying here today. And like I said, if you're, if you're new, we don't normally do things like this, but it's time to take that step of action. Repent loud and proud before God here today. I'm going to pray, and then as I'm done, then we can all stand and join in worship. But while I'm praying, if God is leading you to stand, I just want you to stand and identify that you are repenting and following Jesus today. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this this time. God, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm sorry that at times I've thrown them in a drawer and forgot about them for long periods of time. God, please forgive me. Forgive me, God. Lord, I'm I'm sorry that I've been a bad friend at times and only called upon you and and him when I need something. I'm sorry, God, that I've often been too comfortable in my life, that, that, that I've that I've just uh, put the do not disturb sign on, God, that I heard you calling, that I knew the prompting, that I knew what you wanted me to do, but I failed to do it, God. Please forgive me for that, God. Lord, many of us here have filled ourselves with things in our life that, that are not of you, God. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us of these things, God. Lord, we're coming back to you. God, for those that are here that haven't yet given their life to you, God, I pray today would be the moment that they say, Jesus, I believe who you are. I'm thankful for what you've done on the cross and overcoming the grave. And I ask that you'd forgive me of my sins. And I want to turn and follow you, God. I'm repenting and following you. Please forgive me of my sins. Put your faith in Jesus like that here today. He wants to give you new life and a new hope and a new pathway. And the Holy Spirit wants to come and be in your life. He wants to be your new best friend, and it starts in this one moment right here today to invite him into your life. Just do it. What are you waiting for? God's been calling. He's waiting for you to answer. He wants to change your life, not just now, but for eternity. God, I pray your Holy Spirit to work. Fill each one of us, God. We pray, God, that you would fill us each and every day, Lord. I pray, God, that you would just grow in your relationship with each one of us here today. Thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and worship together.